Welcome to Pathpoint. If you're joining us online, if you're a coffee bar or right here in our sanctuary. By the way, if you're, uh, if you, if you're getting ready and you're just listening to this service as you get ready to come to the 11 o'clock, we've made room for you. You don't want to miss being here and what God wants to do in your life and get in the presence of God. And so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wait for you at the 11. So it's going to be good. Amen. Uh, I have a few things I want to mention today before we get started. As you go ahead and take out your connect card and your insert, also go ahead and take out your uh, small groups brochure. We have uh, uh, small groups beginning today, this week, in fact. Amen. And we have uh, 17 small groups. And I'm so excited as I was looking over that small groups brochure this, this week and I kept reaching for it, kept reaching for it, kept reaching, just reading down through there. Man, I just got this anticipation on the inside of me that God's going to do some great work in our lives in small groups this year. Amen? So you don't want to miss that. I want to call attention to, uh, to two specifically. One, we have a, uh, uh, a small group called Blended and Blessed by Lin Lindsey Jones is leading that. So if you find yourself and you're in a blended family, Great small group for you to attend. Uh, you, can, uh, you can RSVP that on your Connect card, or you can just show up, I've been told by the small group pastor. Just show up. Amen. There's another one there uh, that I want to call attention to, The Power of I Do. By T well, Terry and Catherine Meck, they're going to be teaching that small group, and uh, I'm excited about that. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I've, uh, I've recognized, and I think I've been told by our small groups pastor, that, you know, you may want to go to a small group and you may go, uh, I like this one. And so you stick and you click. And then there's sometimes you go to one or two small groups until you find the one you really, the topic you really land on that's speaking to your heart and your spirit at that moment in time. And that's fine too, isn't it? Isn't it, Pastor Doug? Okay. All right. So feel free to, I'm going to use the word peruse <laughs> through our small groups if you need to and if you want to. To find one that you really land on and you love the subject matter and, uh, and just click with that because it's what God wants to do and speak to you in your life at that moment in time. Amen. So small groups begin this week. So get involved in that. Amen. Now go ahead and keep your connect card and your insert handy. I'm going to continue our series today, Confidential. And uh, today's title is uh, Don't Go It Alone. Don't go it alone. It's, it's recorded in the book of Matthew that Jesus' disciples ask him to teach them how to pray. And so Jesus, the first prayer that he taught his disciples was the prayer of alignment. It's found in Matthew, the sixth chapter. We've been referring to it the last several weeks. He said, Our Father, you're in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I want us to stay focused on the kingdom part and how he defines and explains kingdom. So I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 13. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You see, God's kingdom is a power and glory culture. Grab hold of this. L listen to what I'm saying. People, humanity in general, every one of us are 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 we're on, we're in a power grab. We're trying. We're reaching for power. We're reaching for glory on some level. Every one of us. But and 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 so what's offered to us is a counterfeit. But what? But God only offers the authentic and the original. The real power, the real glory. That glory just simply means magnificence. It means splendor. It means honor. Just. <laughs> I want you to think about that. And so when we do relationships well, God releases the realities of his world, the realities of glory and power into our world. This is God's intent all along. And he reveals to us, or God gives us natural things to reveal truths to us. Natural truths as well as spiritual truths. So I want us to look at 
power and glory today. The kingdom of power and glory. The culture of power and glory. And how it doesn't just belong in heaven. It belongs here on the earth. In the church. Amen. And not, 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 a, not, not a manufactured power and glory. Not a fabricated uh, power and glory. Not a counterfeit power and glory. But I mean the real thing. I, I was reading here recently uh, a, an article where they were talking about the making of the atomic bomb. And that it was, it was produced with the principle of fission. Fission is where they take and split an atom. And it creates a magnificent power. In fact, uh, uh, America used the atomic bomb to end World War II. But did you know that there's a power that's superior to that one? And it's created with the concept of of fusion, not fission. Fission is splitting of an atom. Fusion merges two atoms together. It produces a force that's seven times greater. You see, what division creates is powerful. But what unifies and unites is seven times more powerful. I want you to think about that for just a minute because I I want to explain this power and glory and the counterfeit, uh, the uh, the virtual power, the virtual glory that so often we, we fall victim to. Because when people split, when families split, when cultures split and organizations split and Christians split and churches split, it actually releases a new vision. It actually releases a power, just like that atomic bomb that was created by splitting. That power was created by splitting an atom. And what happens is... When that split happens in regard to people, then there's all of a sudden a birth of a new vision and and you can feel the power and people falsely grab hold of that as, oh, that must be God-sanctioned. That must be God's will. We get all, anytime we feel power, we get all giddy and we get all euphoric and we think, well, that must be, no, it's not. Not necessarily. Are you listening? Not necessarily. Okay. Now, if people split and it creates that kind of power, what happens when people unify? What happens when a community unifies, a culture unifies and unites? You see it even in even our communities around America. Finally, when we, when we laid down our swords and picked up our plowing shears, so to speak, picked up our, the seed, and we started sowing seed instead of fighting one another community-wide. All of a sudden, we started seeing production and effective relief and effective rescue and effective healing and effective uh, just deliverance, delivering people's lives. See that? So when, when people unite and unify, when Christians unite and unify... When families unite and unify, unify, when the church unites, when the people within the four walls of the church unites, what does it produce? It produces a power that's seven times greater, the, it, it, seven times the vision, results that are seven times greater. Again, God gives us natural things to reveal Laws and principles that are just natural, spiritual laws and principles that are at work. And if we go to create, if we if we uh, perform an action, it in time it in time creates a reaction. A cause produces an effect. Amen. Now, what God wants for us, His people is he wants to release the realities of his world into our world. And the realities of his world, the atmosphere of heaven, is full of his glory and power. It's full of it. But he won't release those realities into our world apart from relationships. He won't do it. 
Kingdom power is to be realized in family. It's the family of God that's his target. Did you get that? It's not the people outside the four walls of the church. It's the people within the church. Jesus was sent as a gift to the world. The Holy Spirit was sent as a gift to the church, to the body of Christ. God's intent is to release the culture of his kingdom of power and glory into his house. Amen? So we can't get to where God wants us to go alone, on our own. We can't get to where God wants us to go on our own. Amen? Now, oh my. I heard an African proverb one time. It said this. I read it, actually. Uh, The person wrote, said, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. You know what? I've proven that to be true. You may get out of the blocks fast and you may arrive at what you thought was your destination, your destiny, what you wanted, the place that you thought, when I get there, when I get that done, when I achieve that, that success, and then you get there and all of a sudden you have a whole new horizon. You can't get any, go any further because you didn't go together. God wants promotion for his people, but he wants it to come from his power and glory. You know, there are some things that God just won't talk to us about until we take ownership of this value. And it's not that he's given us the cold shoulder, and it's not that uh, he's given us the silent treatment to punish us. But it's it's that we separate our people relationships from our God relationships, and they are inseparable. They are one in the same. Now, we could go all throughout the Bible and look at story after story about how Jesus had 12 disciples. Huh? I mean, how, how, how you see just one uh, in, uh, event after another, one story after another, but it was all about people doing relationships with one another. Here's, here's a prophetic word. Some of you have not been able to go forward in the business part of your life simply because you don't do relationships. God won't do it apart from relationships. Amen? Grab hold of this. When you start doing relationships well, you watch what happens to your business career. Now, that was just, okay... That was worth the price of a ticket if that's you. (laughs) Amen. But this is how serious God is about this. And I've taken taken a a very, uh, almost inside me, I've taken his heart when it comes to this issue and this value, this belief, this attitude. Remember what we said about culture. There, it's, it, a culture is made up of a spe- specific beliefs, values, and attitudes that we allow to shape our lives. And as we practice them over time, they become our culture. This has to become culture. Amen? Amen. Now, uh, I was talking about story after story in Scripture where, you know, it's almost like God uh, mandated that people come together. People work things out together. I mean, Jesus had a had a had twelve had a dozen guys that he did life with for three and a half years in his earthly ministry. He didn't do this before his three and a half years. So when he was thrown, when I, I'm just going to say, this, when he was thrown into ministry, all of a sudden here comes these twelve honorary scamps. And he has to deal with them. And they talk back. And Peter, whose name means broken reed, which will tell you exactly how he approaches everyone and everything. He approaches it as a broken reed, as a broken person. And if you've ever been a, if you've ever met a broken person, you know exactly. Ooh, everybody's on edge. 
but at the same time, great courage, great, great audacity to take a risk. That's Peter. I could go right down the list of these guys. And every one of them has their own. It, it's like parents, those of you who have, I mean, I look at Casey and Heidi White, and they have five kids. Are any of them the same? No. You know what I'm talking about. That's 12 of these guys. None of them are the same. So you can't say, well, that worked for, that worked for James, so that'll work for Peter. No, it won't. Uh-uh. It won't. And so for, you know, I, I look at Don and I go, y'all got it, you got it easy. You got one Eden. One Eden. One kid. They named her Eden. How simple is that? That already tells you. They prophesied she's going to be fruitful. So there's Bill go over there and pick fruit off of her life. Fruit off of her life. Fruit off of her life. Look at that. Smart people. Missy and I, why don't we think of that? I, I don't know. But just think of all these relationships throughout Scripture and how, these, how, how, how it's almost like they're, they're forced into having a relationship with people that are so unlike themselves. In Acts, the second chapter, let's talk about one of those relationships. In Acts, the second chapter, because I really want you to see how bad it is, and maybe bad is not a good word, how uh, important this is that God wants you to have relationships. In Acts, the second chapter, we see David. God refers to him there in Acts 2 as a prophet. Now, we know that David is a redemptive gift, is mercy, but he actually stands in the office as a, as a prophet even though he became a king. Now, the reason this is so important and we need to clarify this is because a prophet hears God's voice clearly. A prophet hears God's voice accurately. You could even say brilliantly. In fact, a prophet hears God so much more clear than the other redemptive gifts. Mm. And even the other offices of ministry. Which you, many of you know there are five offices of ministry. So, God gives David this dream. And it gets so deep down in his heart, it won't leave him alone. How many of you ever had a dream and it just annoys you? It's just like nags you, nags you, nags you. I want to know what that means. I want to know what that means. I really wish I knew what that meant. And that's, that was where David was at. He knew it was a God-given dream. And so he couldn't, he, but God wouldn't tell him the interpretation. Now, the thing about David is very interesting because he had a, a relationships with three prophets, and one of them was the prophet Nathan. And God actually gave the prophet Nathan the interpretation of David's dream. Why didn't God give David the interpretation of his dream? Relationships. Relationship. He wanted him to depend on somebody else. Now, see, that's not what we want to happen. We want the dream. We want the interpretation. And we want to realize the dream with the, me, myself, and I. But that's not how God does it. So often, he'll say, that's what you want, but that's not my will. My will is for you to have relationships with other people. Could it be that the interpretation of your dream is, is, is waiting for you to have a relationship with someone else other than yourself? Could it be that your prosperity is waiting in the life of someone else? Could it be the answer to your dilemma, that answer is on the inside of somebody else that you wouldn't give the time of day to? God does this, especially in the house of God, in the body of Christ. This is so important for us to, to grab hold of. Again, we cannot get where God wants us to go on our own. We can't get to where God wants us to go on our own. This is so important that we understand it. Amen? Now, let's, let's talk about the obvious challenges of any relationship because they exist, don't they? Anybody in here ever had a relational failure? Raise your hand. Come on. Let's testify. 
I told you this is going to be a year of stories. <laughs> I didn't necessarily say all good ones. Okay, we're going to get to the good ones, though. We've all had relational failures. And, and so we, many times we enter into uh, a, the di- a direction of moving towards a relationship with trepidation, with fear, and with much trembling. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Because we feel the ouch of the previous failed relationship. And I, I want us to see this, that it, it's, in, and it's important to recognize this, that God has given you the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom when it comes to people. Okay, And so many times we just kind of, the only way I know is close our eyes and hold our nose and just dive into a relationship. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want to go in there with eyes wide open and go ahead and, and take the, you know, open your nose too. Okay. We, we don't want to just join. We, we don't want to connect to everyone and join with just anyone. This is... This is So important. Uh, What happens many times when we do that, it stunts our growth. Certain relationships can stunt our growth. They can impede our progress. Now, I know this not only from the word, but I know this from experience. I've had, Missy and I've had uh, people, we've had a relationship in our lives uh, where there were people that we allowed to come in close to us and we came in close with them. Okay? Okay. And we did it because we clicked and we thought this was going to turn out great. And sure enough, they had this ability uh, somehow, some way to, to, to be careless instead of careful and cross the line over into manipulation and control. And we looked up and we go, oh, that's what that is. And literally impede the progress of the vision that God put on our life. Stunt the growth of what was happening in our life. And uh, two or three relationships like that, and you're going, okay, I'm going to be more discerning when it comes to connecting with people and building friendships with people. And and let me say this. Yes, I'm going to put a disclaimer here as far as a pastoral position because, yeah, there are many... Many of the things I'm talking about in this, this, ser- this series that apply to all of us, but there are some things that, uh, that really apply only to people that are in ministry. They really do. There's just a more careful approach that you have to have. And so, uh, but what I'm talking about today applies to us all. It's important that we make sure that we don't just connect to anyone or join just anyone, but that we're selective. And we make sure that by the time I've shifted gears, let's, let's bring in the seven levels of intimacy and relationship that we're really going to get into the next two weeks. promise you we're going to start out with those seven levels, and we're just going to talk about them in the next two weeks. Remember that number one level? I'm going to call them gears. That number one gear is cliches. Clichés. Now, I'll explain all this next week, what a cliché is. Basically, how are you doing? How was your week? That's a cliché. Okay? And then shift to that second gear when, it, when you just your relationships is all about exchanging facts. And then your third is your, your opinions. You're sharing opinions. Then fourth is feelings. It's okay as you're going towards building a relationship that you downshift that maybe you don't share your feelings right off, that you find that the people that you're really looking for to have relationships with, grab hold of this, the ones that you're wanting to connect to are humble, they're kind, they're serving, and they're gentle in their approach to people. Gentle. When you do that, then you can start shifting upwards, one gear to the next, one gear to the next. And then there comes a point in time where you can, uh, where you can exchange loyalty with one another because it's gotten that good and you can trust one another. They can trust you because there's an element of trust that has to be earned. And you can trust them because there's an element of trust that can be earned. Isn't this good? I'm telling you, I'm telling you this, this, will, this will change your life, but it also open up uh, the power of God and the glory of God to your life too. It's accessible. It's available. 
It's just waiting to be released. Amen? Now, I'm going to shift from that. I'm going to shift into cultures. One of the things that I've recognized is, uh, and, and you find this in many different organizations, in, in uh, many different companies, uh, you find it even in churches, is that there's a difference or there are two cultures that I've recognized, a brother culture and a father culture. I want to talk about those two, compare them for just a minute. Because you'll find that these two cultures are very, very different. They're completely different from one another. You see, I never had an earthly brother, but I had cousins that had, were brothers, and I've seen other people that had brothers that I had relationship with. And one of the things I've noticed about brothers is they compete about it. They, they, they compete with everything. They compete for everything. Okay? So if we have a brother culture in the church, then what we find is uh, people compete for everything. There's an element of jealousy. There's an element of one-upmanship. There's an element of, I'm going to outrun you. You're not going to outrun me. I'm going to cross the finish line before you do. I'm going to be successful, uh, more successful than you are. I'm going to surpass you. You're not going to surpass me. Now, I don't mind if you're successful, but you're just not, you're not going to be as successful as I am. That's a brother culture in the church. Are you listening? We see it all throughout Scripture. There are so many times that we see a brother culture. Let me just mention two for the sake of time. Oh, my gosh, I've run out of time already, and it's not even got good yet. It's good, but not great yet, okay? Yeah, it is, actually. Okay. But going from great to wonderful. Okay. Uh, I think of the prodigal son. We know his journey, but he had an older brother who stayed home, and when the prodigal son returned home, his father welcomed him, gave him his robe, his ring, his sandals, the best of the best, threw a party for him, killed the fatted calf. Where was the older brother? Off in a field pouting. And when he came, and, and, and when he came back after the party was over and all the guests were gone, because it looked like, you know, the younger brother had showed him up. He had egg on his face, so to speak. He comes home, and he gives his daddy a tongue lashing. He sets, it, it, he sets his daddy straight. He listening? And here's what he said. Here's what his daddy said. He said, son, you've always been with me, and all I have is yours. You see... He would, the oldest son, even though he had never left the house, he was so busy, focused on competing with his brother, jealous of his brother, that he couldn't even see the goodness of his father. That's a brother culture. Have you ever walked into a church with a brother culture? Oh, my gosh, the first thing they do, they are sizing you up as you're trying to find your pew. Oh, my gosh, you can cut the energy with a knife, the competition in that room. They have figured you out. Uh, some of them are going to follow you to see what kind of car you're driving before you leave the parking lot. They're competing, and you don't even know you're in competition. You didn't even know this was a game. It's a game to them. Got a break yet. The, one of the biggest brother cultures I, that I see in the Bible is the relationship between King Saul and David. Saul was jealous of David, and he had nothing to be jealous of. You listening? And then when the song was written, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. He, he, what happened? His jealousy went to hatred. His hatred went to anger. His anger went to murder. I'm going to kill him. That is the dynamic and the equation that is produced in and potentially is produced in a brother culture. And yet there's so many brother cultures in the church. Competition. One-upsmanship. I'm going to try to win this. 
I'm going to try to be better than. No. Wherever there are healthy spiritual fathers, there is no competition. Everyone succeeds. Everyone wins. There is no jealousy. Here's what, a, here's what a healthy spiritual father does. He comes alongside. He sees two people competing. And he said, hold on. I know, honey, that you can do everything better than everybody else. But we're going to let somebody else do this one. And let you do this other thing. Because you're so good at it too. Well, I want to do that too. Yeah, but if you do that too, then here's what happens. Uh, then that means there won't be a place for that person to do that. And this is what they're best at. This is freedom. This is what I'm talking about, getting free right here. Amen? Getting liberated. Uh, Paul made this statement. He said, you have many teachers, very few fathers. What does that tell us? You have very many Teaching cultures, most of those teaching culture, cultures are brother cultures. And I love a good teacher just like the rest of you. But he said, you have very few father cultures in the church. This is so important. It's so important. Many of you gentlemen, just a few weeks ago, you, 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 I ask you, would you be a part of building a fathering culture here at Path Point Fellowship Church? And you stood up and made a commitment with me to do that very thing. You took communion over it. I'm not going to ask you to stand today, but how many of you men, just raise your hand, if you, if you made that commitment with me. Now, there were more that stood that day than raising their hand today. Amen? But I got you. We'll get you in the second service. Amen? But thank you, gentlemen. For making a commitment. A culture of no competition, of no jealousy, of no envy, of no one upsmanship, of no but everyone succeeds. Everyone, everyone. So that we can keep our focus on the goodness of our Father instead of our focus on the competition of with one another. Amen. Uh, isn't it interesting how most of the time, our people relationships wind up in a conversation that we have with God. You ever notice that? Notice what he said in this prayer of alignment. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Notice he's telling us how to bring our relationships into alignment so that he can bring our relationship with us into alignment. Amen? Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we know it as the love chapter, he went down up through a list of power. He said, uh, the, the, he mentioned the power of mountain-moving faith. He mentioned the power of serving. He mentioned the power of sacrifice, of generosity, of giving. He even mentioned the power of martyrdom. He said, though I give my body to be burned. And then here in verse 8, he says this. Verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13, verse Love never ends. As for the power of prophecies, they'll pass away. As for the power of tongues, they will cease. As for the power of knowledge, it will pass away. And then you go all the way down to the end of that love chapter, and here's what he says. Now abideth the power of faith, the power of hope, and the power of love. And the greatest power that you and I will ever possess is the power of love. Because it will never fail. And it will never end. That's the heart of a father. Is not to compete with his sons. Or not to have his sons and daughters compete with one another. But, have, but that their focus would be on their father. And his goodness. When you really get a revelation of the goodness of God. Because that's where you keep your focus. You have no interest in competing. Because you realize he's my source anyway. He is the one that gives me promotion anyway. My, our spiritual father, Kenneth Copeland, years ago, he taught us, you don't want promotion <clears throat> unless it comes from God. Because if a man gives you promotion, a man can take it away. But once God gives you promotion, he'll never take it from you. Amen. Now you can pay. You can play the politics. <clears throat> Here's him. We're sitting across the table, one another, and he's 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 telling me. He's teaching me the game of life. 
But he's teaching to, it to me from the standpoint of let God do this. Let God do this. Let God do this. Let God be your ally. Let God be the one who tells them. Let God. See, that's true dependence. Amen? Now, so with this truth of 1 Corinthians 13 chapter and the power of love, we, we, can, we can stop looking for another word. We can stop making it more complicated th than it is. We can stop hoping and start helping. And here's how we do it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? The one you've been worshiping with today. The one you've been singing with today. Who's your neighbor? The one you've been listening to this message with today. The one you're, that's sitting in front of you or behind you or sitting to your right or to your left. It's the one that you're going to be exit, exiting this auditorium with today. It's going to be the ones that you see in the children's center, the ones in the coffee bar, the one in the atrium, the one going down the hallway, the one going out to, into the parking lot to get to their car, neighbor. It's the one that you'll see in your small groups this week. These are your neighbors. When we do relationships well with one another in the house of God, God will release the realities of his world into our world. And, he, <clears throat> and I got a vision of it. I was sitting out there. I was sitting out here in front of this church, in front of Path Point. And all I know is the whole congregation, I don't know why we were out there. All of us were out. By the way, it wasn't a cold day. It was a nice. <laughs> it was a nice sunny day. No wind. About 70, 72 degrees. No wind again. I'm standing out there, and we're all out there, out here on this, the west side of the building. And I say, I say this, look, look, look. The glory is coming. The power is coming. Look at it. Here it comes. It's rolling in. And I just remember we got... Every one of us could see it. It started rolling in. We could start feeling it. And it took over our lives. Somebody give the Lord praise in this house. Amen.